welcome all to our uh, Tuesday evening uh, Zoom session. Today's topic is uh, reasons to always rejoice in the Lord. And before we go into the actual message, I'm going to request uh, Shashikala to read a passage from the Old Testament, uh, Habakkuk chapter 3, verses 17 to 19. Yes, sir. Though the fig trees does not bud, and there is no grapes on the vines, Though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen, and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will be joyful in God my Saviour. The Sovereign Lord is my strength, He makes my feet like a feet of a deer, He enables me to tread on the heights, for the director of music on my stringed instruments. Praise God. Uh, this passage from the Old Testament. And the Old Testament, uh, the writer writes about how, when everything seems to go wrong, yet I'll be joyful in God my Savior. Uh, now, Old Testament, uh, the blessings were conditional to obedience. Uh, the Lord told them, when they obeyed God, they'd be blessed. When they disobeyed God, they'd be cursed. So th this uh, writer realized that when they go through difficult times, it is probably because of the fact that they had uh, sinned against God and God's not blessing them. He says, yet I'll be joyful in God, my Savior. And he understood that because of their sins, they're facing this problem. And God already warned them about the fact that if they don't obey God, they're going to be uh, cursed. So he's not blaming God for what's happening around them. Rather, he says, I'll be joyful in God, my Savior. That's the Old Testament. And independent of circumstances, Habakkuk says, I will joyful in God my Savior. And his joy was in the Lord. That's the Old Testament. Now in the New Testament, we know from John 1.16, from the fullness of his grace, we received one blessing after another blessing. Today we are a people who are blessed abundantly by the Lord because of his grace. Today blessings are not earned as in the Old Testament time. Old Testament time, blessings for obedience, curses for disobedience. In a way, blessings were earned through obedience. Today it's not like that. We are God's chosen people, blessed by the Lord, purchased by the Lord to belong to Him. We have grace, and because of grace, we have blessing after blessing. How much more should rejoice independent of circumstances? Yet there are many people who tell me, brother, how can I praise God and rejoice in Him when I have difficulties? I don't feel like doing it. In the New Testament we read, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16, 17, 18, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks. For this is the will of God and Jesus concerning you. Rejoice always. Rejoicing is a verb. The corresponding noun is joy. We rejoice because we have joy. And the joy we have is knowing that we have the eternal salvation given to us freely by the Lord. And in the letter of Peter, written to Christians living in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia and Bithynia, he writes in 1 Peter chapter 1, 8 and 9, Though you have not seen him, you love him. If they don't see him now, you believe in him and are filled with inexpressible and glorious joy, inexpressible and glorious joy. For receiving the goal of a faith, the salvation of their souls. The goal of their faith was salvation of their souls. Not circumstances, not I want blessing, I want this, I want that. Asking God for many things, material things we ask God so often. And our hope in Christ is not for material things. It is for the fact that we have the hope of salvation and Christ in us is the hope of salvation. Christ in us is the hope of glory. Colossians 1.27 From the time we accept Him as Savior and Lord, He lives in us. He doesn't leave us. His Spirit in us is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. So because of that we have joy and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So always we can rejoice. 
Christ lives in us always and that is the hope of our salvation, hope of glory and the rejoice in the hope of glory. So why do Christians sometimes feel, I can't rejoice in the circumstances, I'm not able to have joy. That's because we're looking at the circumstances and not the Lord who can change circumstances ultimately for our good. Now in the Bible read about people who felt depressed, discouraged at times. In Psalm 42 verse 5, we read uh, the Psalm of uh, Korah. Why do downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed with me? Put your hope in God. For, for yet I'll praise you, my Savior, my God. My soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you, O Lord. I will remember you. Future tense, not past tense, present tense. He's not remembering the Lord. Looking at circumstances, we get discouraged. Now, I'm going to share with my own life. This topic is a favorite topic for me because that's what I live by. I've been a Christian for 44 years and God never gave me one reason to complain against him. Not one reason. I've had difficulties in life. Uh, sometimes because of my own uh, wrong actions, sometimes because of people being jealous of me and uh, being uh, you know, wanting to pull me down. Doesn't really make a difference because only matter what people are and whatever we do, God is still loving, gracious God. Infinite love, everlasting love, unconditional love. So you know when who God, we know who God is, we'll find no reason to complain against Him. Opposite of rejoicing the Lord is complaining, arguing, complaining, questioning, grumbling. It's the opposite of rejoicing in the Lord. Now, it's very important for us to know why God wants us to rejoice in Him? I'll explain come a little later, but I won't talk about the fact that when we remember who God is to us, there's no reason for us to complain. And rather than in complaining, every reason to praise Him, to honor Him, to praise Him, to worship Him, to glorify Him, to rever Him. Glorify Him, rever Him, exalt Him, praise Him, worship Him. He's awesome God, almighty God, awesome God. Now, when you remember who God is, number one, and number two, remember who you are in Christ, there's no reason for us to complain. Every reason for us to always rejoice because these two never change. Who God is to us never changes. Who we are in Him never changes. That's why we rejoice. That's why we've got every reason to always rejoice in Him. Always God is the same to us and we are the same to Him. He never changes. Malachi chapter 3 verse 6 I the Lord do not change. So let's look at what the Bible says about who God is to us. Then I talk about who we are to God. Then I talk about what happens when you always rejoice in Him. Never complain, never argue, never question. See, when you obey God, we face difficulties. Look at difficulties, people complain to God. In spite of difficulties, we worship Him because of who He is. In Philippians chapter 2, from verse 14, Paul writes, Do everything without complaining or arguing. It may become blameless and pure. Children of God, without fault, in a crooked and depraved generation. As a shine, like star the universe as you hold out the word of life. Instead of arguing, complaining, grumbling, and questioning God, we, our, our vocabulary must be always thanksgiving, praise, and worship, and rejoicing in the Lord. Let's look at his, his characteristics, the attributes of God. We look at the attributes of God, the hearts are full of joy for Him because we are in Him. He is love. Number one, 1 John 4, 16, God is love. His love is unconditional. Romans chapter 8, 38, 39, 37, 30, sorry, 38, 39 talks about nothing separate from God's love. His love is everlasting. Jeremiah 31, 3, he says, I love you with an everlasting love 
adorned with my loving kindness. God is love. It's not that just that God loves, he is love. The personification of love. He is a merciful God. Daniel chapter 9 verse 9. Mercy means, does not treat us as our sins deserve. He withholds punishment, that's his mercy. For our bad action, we deserve punishment. He withholds punishment. That is mercy of God. Not giving us what we deserve. Mercy of God. He is a God of all grace. He gives us blessings we don't deserve. First Peter chapter 5, verse 10 talks about, He is a God of all grace. He is love. He is mercy personified. He is a God of all grace. He is a faithful God, faithful to all His good promises, faithful in every aspect of our life. Joshua 23, chapter verse 14, a faithful God, gracious God, compassionate God, loving God. He is a God of all comfort. In 2 Corinthians, chapter 1, verse 3 onwards, Paul writes, Pray to God and Father of Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion, the God of all comfort, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles. Whatever trouble we go through, so look, instead of looking at the trouble, we look to the Lord, what happens is we will find comfort in Him. Because He's given us the Holy Spirit to live in us, who by nature is a comforter. Comforter, Encourage, strengthen, he strengthens us. So God of all comfort, comfort us in all our troubles. When we go through troubles, we question God, so why this trouble has come? Instead of asking Lord, in this trouble, Lord, comfort me. Help me rise above these difficulties by the comfort you give me. Very often I share about uh, uh, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 4, where Jesus says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. The word blessed means happy. Blessed or happy are those who mourn. How can you be happy when you're mourning? Because in the mourning period, he comforts us. So in some mourning, we rejoice. We are comforted and therefore we rejoice. God of all comfort. Psalm 86 verse 15 plus many other verses in the Bible. They very often share that. So many verses in the Bible say the same thing in the Old Testament. Old Testament God. Gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love. Psalm 86 verse 15. Psalm 103 verse 8. Nehemiah 9 17. Joel 2 13. Psalm 145 verse 8. Exodus 34 chapter verse 6. Jonah chapter 4 verse 2, all these verses say the same thing. Old Testament God, gracious, compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. And God is a God who loves to bless us with good things. In the book of Jeremiah, 32nd chapter, 38 to 41, the Lord says, They will be my people, I will be their God. I will give them singleness of heart and action. They will always fear, hear, uh, fear me for their own good, the good of the children after them. I will make an everlasting covenant with them. I will never stop doing good to them. And I inspire them to fear me, they will never turn away from me. I will rejoice in doing them good. Our God never stopped doing good to us. He rejoices in doing good to us. He rejoices. He finds joy in doing good to us because He loves us in everlasting love. Those of us are parents, we know how much we want to bless our children with good things. In their little resources, we'll deny ourselves and give to our children. How much more the Heavenly Father gives us the best things, not good things, best things, because of, because of amazing love for us. There is no flaw in the Lord. 1 John 1.5 God is light. In Him there is no darkness. So how can you ever complain to God about any matter? Things in the world are because of sin. Negative things in the world, sickness, disease, 
death, curses, unhealthy fears, separation from God, death are all because of sin. And God is not responsible for sin. He's not responsible for sin. Mankind and the devil are responsible for sin. And therefore, please don't blame God for what people do or circumstances come your way. He is sovereign God. He'll change circumstances to bring us something best for us. He's a redeemer. One more beautiful aspect of a God is he's a redeemer. He redeems a life from the pit. Psalm 103 verse 4. So everything about God is perfect. He's perfection personified. That's what he is to all of us. Without exception. He shows no favoritism. Sometimes we think that you know God is very partial to the other person. No. He shows no partiality. Romans chapter 2 verse 11. With him there is no favoritism. Romans 2 11. Ephesians 6 9. Colossians 3 25. And Acts 10 34. God shows no favoritism. He's the same to all of us. He loves every one of his children. John 3 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. This salvation is a gift for everybody in the world. Who are the ones who benefit from it? Who receive that gift? 1 John 2 2 says, He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Not only for our sins, for sins of the whole world. So Christ's sacrifice is for the whole world. And he is our salvation. Psalm 27 verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? David says. I just share with some of the attributes of God. There's no flaw in the Lord. He is perfection personified. And therefore, when you remember who he is, Loving, gracious, merciful, comforting Father. Then there's no reason for us to ever question Him, argue with Him, or complain to Him. He's so patient. He's the personification of love. And love is patient. Look at the attributes of love mentioned in the 13th chapter of 1st Corinthians. That's the love we are, we are supposed to manifest actually. But the love is exemplified in God's love for us. He is love. So all the qualities mentioned in 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians 4 to 8 are personified in the Lord. Love is patient. Love is kind. Does not envy. Does not boast. Is not proud. Is not rude. Is not self-seeking. Not easily angered. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight evil. Does the truth. Always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. So that's some of the attributes, attributes of God. Some of the attributes. There are so many attributes of God. Awesome God. God of wisdom. God of power. God of strength. And therefore, we remember that we won't complain to God. We'll rejoice. Rejoice who God is. That's number one. And he never changes. Malachi 3.6 I, the Lord, do not change. Unchanging God. So all the attributes of God that I mentioned just now remain forever. Because God is forever. Two things never change in this earth. Maybe in the universe. I don't know about the other parts of the universe. I, I mean, we are living on this earth. Two things never change. Number one, God never changes. Number two, his word never changes. In Psalm, uh, not Psalm, sorry. In Matthew, 24 chapter, verse 35, Jesus says, Heaven earth will pass away, my word will never pass away. One more thing I want to say, it doesn't change. Our identity in Christ, that never changes. God never changes. His word never changes. Who we are in Him never changes. Number one, we are His children. All those who accept him as Savior and Lord have become his children. They remain as children forever. Our identity as God's children never changes. For us to always rejoice in the Lord, we remember who he is to us, number one. Remember who
who you are in him. I told you the Bible never changes. And the Bible is like a mirror. It mirror. It reveals who we are. Our entity in Christ. Number one, we are God's children. We remain God's children. Never forget that. We always remain God's children. We are once slaves of sin. In fact, we belong to the evil one. And we are saved from that. We are God's children now. And uh, in Romans, uh, sorry, in uh, John 8.35, Jesus says that a slave doesn't belong to the family. Not forever, only for some time he's a slave. But a son belongs to the family forever. We were slaves of sin, slaves of devil, and we were under devil's control. But God rescued us. Now we are in God's kingdom. We are children of God. That is forever. Once you become a child of God, you remain a child of God. God never disowns us. If he ever disowns us, he's like him disowning himself. Second Timothy 2.13, Paul writes, even though we are faithless, he remains faithful. For he cannot disown himself. We are God's children. We are heirs of God, number two. Romans 8, 17. If you are children, we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his suffering, in order we share in his glory. What have God has been given to Christ, we are co-heirs with him. One day we'll be with him in heaven forever. And where he is, we're going to be when we serve him. In John 12, 26, Jesus says, Whoever serves me must follow me. Where I am, my servant will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. So we are his children. We are his heirs. We are his servants. We are called to be his servants. We can choose to become enemies, unfortunately. It's possible. James 4, 4 tells us that. But if we have some wisdom, we will not do that. If we love God, we will want to serve him. And also... We are called to be his friends. John 15, 15. Look at the amazing potential of being a friend of God. Throughout all the disciples, I no longer call his servants. Your servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything I have learned from the Father, I have made known to you. Can you imagine what the Father taught him, the Lord Jesus Christ, he shared with his friends. We are called to be his friends. What a joy it is to know you are a friend of the living God. Abraham was called God's friend. James 2.23 Moses was God's friend. In the book of Exodus we read, God told uh, the people with him, it says that, that he poked God face to face like a man speaks with his friend. 11th verse. And therefore, we can choose to be his friends and thereby realize how precious we are to him. Number four, we are in the hands of the Lord. And no one can snatch us out of his hands. John 10, 27 and 28. In his hands, we are a crown of splendor, a royal diadem in the hand of God. Isaiah 6, 2, 3. Can you imagine we are in the hands of God? You're looking at us and a royal diadem in the hands of God. Now, as he looks at us, a royal dad in his hands, he sings over us. We are his delight. Zephaniah 3.17 says, The Lord is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. God sings over us. He rejoices over us. Can you imagine? He rejoices over us. Because he purchased us by his blood. When he, the living God, awesome God, rejoices over us, how can we not rejoice over him? For who we are in him. Never complain to God. Rejoice in the fact you are belong to him, purchased by his blood, they'll never change. You are bought by his blood. He will not sell us for a higher price. 
There's no higher price than the blood of Christ. Next as per identity is with the apple of God's eye. In Zechariah 2 8, the Lord says, He who harms you harms the apple of his eye. Anyone harms us, harm the apple of his eye. In fact, when anyone harms us, they are harming Jesus. When they persecuted, they persecuted Jesus. Why are we taking personally? Oh, he's, he insulted me, he did this to me, I'm very upset, I'm hurt. Give the hurt to Jesus. They're hurting him, not you. When anyone hurts Jesus, they're going to be hurt, get hurt. The Lord gave a shocking, put a shocking question to Saul. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Saul was confused. Who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus of Nazareth, whom you're persecuting. Saul was persecuting Christians. Then he realized he actually persecuting Jesus when he said that. What a change happened in Saul's life after that. What a change. Because he realized what a thing he had done. He was doing a favor to God by persecuting Christians. But in that process, persecuting the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, he was persecuting. And Jesus told him, it's hard for you to kick against the goats. It's hard for you to kick against the goats. You, when you kick against the goats, you get hurt. So why be taking person people against us? He identifies himself with us, our Lord. Anyone harms us, harms the apple of his eye. Remember, you're the apple of his God's eye. You're so precious to God. In the book of Isaiah, 43 verse 4, he says, I've loved you with, loved you with everlasting love. And that's sorry, Jeremiah 31 3. Everlasting love. I've drawn you with loving kindness. Isaiah 43 4 says, Isaiah 43 4, you are precious and honor in my sight, and I love you. You are precious, number one, honor in my sight, and I love you. Unchanging God says unchanging things to us. So please remember who you are in Christ, who God is to you, who you are in Him. So many aspects of identity. Be a priest of God, for example. Be a priest. Priests of God. A royal priesthood we are. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9. And when the Son of God, or the, as the Lamb of God, takes the scroll from the Ancient of Days, sitting on the throne, the 24 elders and the four living creatures worship the Lamb of God in song. Revelation chapter 5, 9 and 10. You are worthy to take the scroll and open the seals, uh, uh, open, the, open the seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you purchased men from for God, from every tribe and language and people and nation, and made them be a kingdom and priests. We are a kingdom belonging to God, His kingdom we are part of, and priests of God Most High. One more amazing aspect is we are God's inheritance. Inheritance, he, 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 he inherits us, waiting for us to go to heaven. Psalm 94, verse 14. God will not reject his people. God will not reject his people. He will never forsake his inheritance. We are purchased by his blood. We belong to him. He longs for his inheritance to join him in heaven. One day when you go to heaven, he's precious to God. There are so many other aspects of identity. I have no time to explain all that. But it is enough for us to never complain to God. Always rejoice independent of circumstances. Now, some people ask me this question. Why God wants us, wants us to worship Him? To be joyful always? When things are so bad, how can I praise God? How can I worship Him? Why does God want me to worship Him? One, one person even asked me, is God so egoistic? Why so, so much the ego is God? We must praise Him and worship Him. The fact is, whether we praise Him or don't worship, we praise Him, He remains the same. A sovereign God, far above every authority. When we worship Him, our circumstances change. When we worship Him, devil backs off. For our good, God wants to worship Him. My child, you worship me. You glorify my name. You see how your life changes. Because devil stops. Troubling us when we worship God and praise God. So, what is the story in the Bible? Very familiar passage, a chapter actually. Second Chronicles 28th chapter. It's a story about King uh, Hezekiah, who is actually a king of Judah of, uh, in Jerusalem. And three armies come to attack him. 
Moabites, Ammonites, and the Munites. Moabites are descendants of uh, Lot's one daughter. Lot and his daughter had a relationship. Other daughter, Ammonites. And third is Esau's descendants. This is Esau from Mount Seir. Munites. The Moabites, Ammonites, and Munites all joined together, came to attack Jerusalem. Hezekiah was a godly king. Sorry, it's not Hezekiah. It's Jehoshaphat. I made a mistake. A similar thing happened with Hezekiah also. That was the Babylonians who came. But this is Jehoshaphat, who was king in Jerusalem, when three armies came to attack. Second Chronicles 28 chapter verse 5 says, We find Jehoshaphat, along with all the Israelites, stood up and prayed to God. Three armies came to attack. Moabites, Ammonites, Munites, to attack Jerusalem. And Jehoshaphat stood and prayed. He stood and prayed along with everybody. He prayed to God and said, Lord, when we came from Egypt, you never allowed us to attack these people, Moabites, Ammonites. You had said, don't attack them. You bypass them. You want them to be spared from us attacking them. See how they're repaying us. Lord, this come with a vast army. We have no power to face the enemy. We don't know what to do, but our eyes are fixed upon you. Second Chronicles 20th chapter, verse 12. We can't face the army. We don't know what to do. Our eyes are upon you. And Jahaziel was raised up by God. He spoke up, Jahaziel. He said, God is not going to fight your battle. Don't worry. God will fight your battle. But the Lord is not yours. And then the Lord tells to Jahaziel, to Jehoshaphat and the, all the Israelites, go and face the enemy. Well, they come up by the valley of Ziz. Go and face them. Don't let them fight the battle. I'll find the battle for you. I'll fight the battle. Now what happens, Jehoshaphat, along with the other people, they decide, they'll send singers in front of the army. Singers. Army is trained to fight a war. Three armies are coming. Amorabites, Ammonites, and Munites. And uh, here you find uh, the singers being appointed to go in front of the army. Very embarrassing for the uh, army people. No? When the singers go in the front, and they began to sing the splendor of His holiness, splendor of His holiness. What is the song they sang? Give thanks, Lord, for His love endures forever. That's the song they sang. They didn't sing because they're going to win the war. They, they never had to fight the war. God was, I'll fight the war. Battle is mine, it's not yours. Don't be discouraged. But you go and face the enemy. So Jehoshaphat sends the many mommy is in the front, the singers go in the front, and it says they sang the song. Give thanks to Lord for love and yours for her. Second Chronicle 20, chapter verse 21 and 22. The Bible says when they began to sing, the Moabites and Ammonites killed the Munites. After killing the Munites, they both helped kill each other. Moabites and Ammonites joined together to kill the Munites and they helped to kill each other. Finally, when they reached the, uh, the place where the army was coming up, there was nobody there, all dead. They took the ammunition and the spoils of the war and went back home. Never had to fight the battle. But they began to sing to God. Not because God would win the battle for them. They sang to God because His love endures forever. Give thanks to God, His love endures forever. Please read 2 Chronicles 20, chapter 21, 22. So when you have difficult circumstances, enemy coming our way, you worship God, praise Him and worship Him. In the of circumstances, they will back off. In those days, enemy of these people were Moabites, Ammonites, Munites. Enemy of people living in Jerusalem, in Judah. Who is the enemy today? The devil and his angels, fallen angels. So when we worship God and rejoice in Him, what happens is confusion in enemies camp. He backs off. He can't stand God being praised. The devil thinks he's the opposite of God. He's not the opposite of God. He's under God. Satan is the opposite of the archangel of God. Michael, Gabriel, the archangels. And the opposite of that is Satan. He's not the opposite of God. He's under God. He thinks he's like God. He wants to be like God. So when we worship the Lord, our living God, loving God, 
then he doesn't like it. He'll back off. So God wants to worship him because we are going to be delivered through the evil one even as we worship God. So an example I've seen in my own ministry. When I face the enemy, I worship God, sing songs of worship and praise to him, they will back off. He can't stand Jesus being praised. But we praise Jesus not because we want the devil to go. We praise him because we love him. Who he is to us, don't forget. Who we are to him, don't forget. These two never change. Look at Job. Talk about circumstances. What terrible circumstances he had. In one day he lost all his possessions. One day, all the possessions he lost. 7,000 sheep, 2,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 donkeys. Seven sons, three daughters. All lost in one day. When he got the news about everything being lost in one day, what do you do? Job chapter 1 verse 20. He fell down and worshipped God. Any one of us have got a burst up more problem than what Job had? Ten children, all lost in one day. All possessions gone. For no fault of his. God testifies himself. There's no fault of his. Actually, God was so happy with Job, he showed up Job to Satan. Job chapter 1 verse 8. Have you considered my servant Job? There's no one like God like him. He blames is an upright. Man, he fears God and shuns evil. The devil says, oh, you put a hedge around him. He's your favorite. He's your favorite child. That's why he's doing all this. And God's okay, you can touch him. In possessions. And after all that happened, he's still praising God. Same thing he says. He's praising God. Fell down worship God. What did God say about Job again? Second time? Chapter 2, verse 3 of Job. Same thing God says. Have you considered my servant Job? There's no one like God like him. He blames an upright. Man fears God and shuns evil. And God has something else. He still maintains his integ integrity, although you incited me to harm him without any reason. You incited me to harm him without any reason. No reason why he was he was uh, uh, lost all the possessions. But then something wonderful happened. Through the suffering, he can know God that much more. When he went through all the trials, his friends came and advised him. Sincere friend, but sincerely wrong advice they gave. Out of four, only three, one gave the right advice. One spoke rightly, that is Elihu. Other three spoke wrongly. They were sincere friends, sincerely wrong advice they gave. And Job says in 19th chapter of Job, 25-26, when he went through all the trials, I know my Redeemer lives. And then he will stand upon the earth. After my skin has been destroyed, in my flesh I will see God. What happened after that? After God spoke to him, asked him many questions, not one question Job could answer, question about life and universe and cosmos, nothing he could answer. And then he says, 42nd chapter of Job, verse 5, to God he says, My ears have heard of you, now my eyes have seen you. What God brought about beautiful in Job's life was a revelation of himself. So it always is a blessing for us to worship him, to rejoice in him, we rejoice in God our Savior. Old Testament time, Habakkuk says, everything is lost. Nothing is there in the sheep pen, the crops are failed, everything is gone. Nothing good is happening around me. I will joyful in God my Savior. I will rejoice in the Lord. Today we rejoice because of who He is to us, who we are to Him. Never forget that. Never forget who He is to you. Never forget who you are to Him. He's gone to heaven, preparing mansions for us. One day He'll come and take us to be with Him. There he is. We'll be with him in heaven forever and ever. That hope we rejoice. Rejoicing in hope of the glory of God. Hope of resurrection. Hope of this body being raised to life. And having the same similar body to the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christian, Christian vocabulary must be always worshipping him. Praising him. Honoring him. Exalting him. And glorifying him. Five things. Glorifying. Exalting. Honoring, praising, worshipping. No place for grumbling, arguing, questioning, and complaining. The corner. There are people in the Bible who complain to God. But don't take the example in that. Take the example of what the right thing they did. That is full of examples. Full of examples. What you should follow, what you should not follow. That's also there. In the Bible, not one person was sinless except Jesus. The only sinless person ever who walked on this earth. 
all the other men of God, women of God, they're wonderful men of God. God used them wonderfully. But they were humans. They had their flaws. And therefore, if you're wise, people learn from the good they did, reject the wrong thing they did. If you look at 13th chapter of uh, Hebrews 7 and 8, remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of the way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. What I share with you about who God is, who we are to God, are all in the scripture. So our faith is faith in God's word. God's word says we are the apple of God's eye. We believe that. Simple. God's word says we are his children. We believe that. What God says about what God says about God and us, we believe that. Therefore, we rise above circumstances. Always rejoice. In difficult circumstances, we rejoice. Don't lose zeal for God. Romans chapter 12, 11 and 12 says, Romans 12 chapter, 11 and 12, never be lacking in zeal. Keep a spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Joyful in hope. No difficult circumstance remains forever. It all changes. No trouble is permanent. Light and momentary. Joyful in hope. Hope is a person. Is Jesus. First Timothy chapter 1 verse 1. Jesus Christ, comma, our hope. He is a hope. He is a light, our salvation. He is our savior. And nothing flaws there in the Lord. So how can anyone complain to God? Complain about him. And don't feel sorry for yourself also. Now, the beautiful thing is, when you worship what I told you, benefit of that is, they will black, back off completely. And you, you're pleasing God by your attitude towards him of being thankfulness, praising him, thanking him, worshipping him, independent of circumstances. Just think how God was so happy with Job. When he got the news of everything being lost, he fell down and worshipped God. God was so happy, he showed off Job to Satan. Look at my servant Job, there's no one like him in all the earth. Blameless, upright, man who fears God and stands evil. And therefore, let our vocabulary be always be thanksgiving, praise and worship. And in every circumstance, we worship God. Now, the benefit is, we benefit when we worship God. Don't, don't ask, when people tell you, why, should, why is God egoistic? God is not egoistic, altogether humble. He left the glory in heaven, came to earth, Jesus. And therefore, He's a selfless God. What He wants us to do is for our good. We don't change God by what we do. He's still on His throne. When we obey Him, we change for the better. We are the ones blessed. So therefore, always rejoice. You have a reason for us to rejoice, isn't it? Why? Or who God is to us, so many attributes. Who we are to Him, so many attributes. Don't forget that. Worship Him, praise Him, thank Him. The fact that He is precious to us and nothing has changed our identity in Jesus. May God bless you all. Let me pray for you and then we we'll close, stop the recording. Then we will uh, pray. Uh, we will sing. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for the wonderful time, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for, for us to know who we are in you, Lord. Thank you for delight us in you, Lord. We got desires of our heart, Lord. We thank you. We praise you. We give you glory, Lord. Thank you, Master, who we made us to be, Lord. Teach us, Lord. Remind us, Lord, never to complain, never to argue or question you. But simply by faith, worship you for who you are, Lord. And always rejoice, Lord. Pray without ceasing and everything give thanks. We thank you, praise you, give you glory. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you all.